Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, Budgeting for Concert Lighting, Determining How Much Your Show Should Cost, presented by Chris McMee. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. Just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a Q&A function where you can submit your questions to the presenter and he'll try to answer as many questions as possible at the end. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We are continuing our learning sessions into 2021, so please watch the calendar for upcoming sessions that are being added weekly, and you can find that calendar on pro.harman.com. And now I would like to introduce you to Chris McMean, the presenter for today's webinar. Chris has worked in various facets of the lighting industry for over 30 years, starting as an electrician in the 80s to running a lighting shop in the 90s and then working at a rental shop. He then worked with Sharf Weisberg as VP of Sales and then Christy Lights as a rental rep. And now I'll pass it over to you, Chris. Hey, everybody. Happy Tuesday. So today we're talking about budgeting for shows. So the way I start this off is I usually talk about projects I've worked on and sort of uh, how we got to budgets. And uh, so our first slide is... Uh, you know, talking about types of packages. Um, there are a bunch of different types of concert packages that we run into. Um, the uh, one you're looking at right here is a festival package. Uh, this was actually designed by Shot, uh, Scott Shemaleski. Um, and uh, so the way we get to budget on this one, this is pretty much a full package. So we had truss lighting, uh, distro. Um, so we had both up and down packages and a front of house package. So here in this type of show, you're, you're doing a complete budget, a turnkey budget. So you're providing labor services and um, as well as transportation to the job. So this kind of shows you a good, you know, versatile package had a bunch of auras on it, had a bunch of vipers on it. Um, and uh, we had a couple days to install it. Uh, the crew lived out on site until uh, the end of the show and then struck it all and came home. And uh, this sort of gives you a sort of a nice round picture to look at. Um, uh, the next type of package we're gonna look at is uh, concert packages for television. Uh, this is actually a shot from uh, New Year's, um, and this is uh, a multiple stage outdoor package. Uh, this was designed by Paul Miller. And, uh, you know, you can kind of see that, you know, you have a, a, a floor package a behind this, uh, a, a separate behind the uh, band package as well as uh, they had two side lighting positions out front instead of one straight across. And then they had follow spots from straight across. So again, you had three sort of major components to this. You had the front of house lighting from the two side positions and then a behind the band package position as well as follow spots. So that sort of gives you, you know, more of a, a, a you know, more about television and uh, less about lighting the band. And, uh, but still a, a large component of this was uh, an effects package. Uh, the next package we're gonna look at here is, uh, this is an EMD concert package. So this again is a, a package where we provided uh, uh, labor heads as well as uh, lights and truss and motors and uh, as well as a front of house package. Now this type of package is pretty much the standard for EDM where you're, you're, you're doing everything providing heads and then the promoter or the producers providing local labor. Um, but this shows you a good versatility where you have moving lights, conventionals, truss motors, all roll in at the same time and go up at once together. Um, when you're budgeting packages like this, you really need to you know, know that you should break down the components. So you break down the, uh, the front of house package, 
you know, that's a separate budget from the stage package and the console package, because some venues may have a console package that they want to use. So if you break those down sort of into the components, when you're putting together your budgeting, you can uh, get a better idea of, you know, how to bring your budget down, or if you have some more room, how to bring your budget up. Now that doesn't happen very often. I, I haven't had too many people who are like, wow, that's great. Let's add a ton more stuff. Um, at least in the initial process. Usually a lot of the ads happen uh, after the fact, usually at rehearsals or the first show, they'll want to add a package because somebody wants more than you know what they currently have. Um, but this is sort of a nice package to look at as far as, you know, you have a conventional package, you have a moving light package, you have the truss and motors, you have consoles, came in turnkey with guys. Um, now, something that's developed in the last sort of, you know, five, six years has been concert ambient lighting packages, where they're not just lighting the concert itself, they're lighting the venue. Um, this is also at Avon Gardner in uh, Brooklyn. And uh, what they're doing here is they created an entire, basically, tunnel to, uh, for people to walk through and to add ambience to the concert. Um, a lot of the bigger outdoor stages are now uh, doing sort of, you know, tree lighting and, you know, they're, they're bringing the, the theater into the audience. And uh, so this package, you know, we just actually did a rental package on and the venue provided heads and installation and did all that part. But again, different way of budgeting. Um, so this was a Madison Square Garden package, um, and uh, pretty sure this was John Legend, um, and very simple, clean, multi-layered package. Again, you had a conventional look with some film fixtures, then you had some uh, LED blinders, LED movers, uh, MSR movers. So you, you really had some good layer in here to, to create some, uh, some cool effects. Um, with, you know, most of the time when we're working at Madison Square Garden, they expect us to come in with leads, all the prep work done, um, all that's done in the shop, and then load in very quickly and then a show that night and then back out that night. So it's really a one day uh, event usually, although, you know, some shows can stay there longer, but most of the time when you're going in there, it's a, you know, a one day thing or a two day thing. Um, so this is an arena lighting package. So this shows, uh, this is uh, Katy Perry um, in Seattle. Um, this shows you what a large outdoor scale package um, you can end up with. Um, again, with an arena package, you're using brighter lights, more lights. Um, everything was pre-rigged into pre-rigged truss or so rolled right in. Uh, you save a lot of time on site by adding fixtures into truss before you move into a venue. Um, and you have follow spots and you have front house positions. Uh, we had multiple consoles on this. Uh, we we don't provide the LED package, but you know, you can imagine that that also is another large portion of the budget. Um, but this was, again, one day concert um, set up a couple days in advance, bring it out and then your show. And same thing on this. We provided project managers. Everything was prepped in the shop. So there was some labor in the shop. They show up on site. Crew chief sets up the package with his guys. Show goes off and then it comes down that night. Um, now a lot of times with these large arena packages, you're going to have an opening act. Um, and usually what happens with the opening act is they don't bring their own whole rig with them, but they rent a portion of the rig and they bring their own programmer. So with a lot of these opening acts, you're, you're somewhat having to use the rig that's already there. 
and you might not get to use all of it. You might be budgeted for a certain amount. So again, that's a separate budget line um, for your opening act. Or if they're using some of the house package, it could be the same budget line. But uh, you know, the crew is usually in addition to whatever that package was. Now, some tours you do, they're doing clubs around the country. Um, and those people, they just want a floor touring package. Uh, this was designed by Mark Janowitz. Um, and this was a floor package only tour. Um, and this was a stop when they stopped at Terminal 5 in New York. But they were, they were, you know, it was a very quick, easy setup system that was set up behind the, the band. This is called, called a floor only package. And then your front of house is usually provided and your overheads are provided by uh, the venue. Um, and the promoter sets that up in advance or you set that up in advance, uh, depending on, you know, what size show it is, who it is and who the tour manager is. Um, so this is a concert package for a movie shoot. So same type of, uh, same type of thing where you're providing all of the elements. Um, but usually on the movie package, movie shoot packages, they have a little more budget. So this was for the Miles Davis movie. Um, and we provided a Viper package for this some great overheads, um, conventional package, LED package. Uh, the LED walls were uh, brought in by another company, but uh, we did all the, uh, all the lighting package on this. And again, you know, two crew, uh, two crew chiefs for the day, put it in, set it up, shoot that day, out the next day. Um, then we're going to move on to uh, corporate event concert packages. Um, so at corporate events, a lot of times they will, uh, you know, do a show. Um, that spec is usually based on who's performing. Um, so a lot of the performers come with riders. They come with their LDs. Uh, they forward that stuff to the, you know, to the event staff uh, in advance. And the, then there's some negotiation back and forth about what they can actually provide. Um, for this package, I think they went above and beyond. This was actually uh, for Harmon. So this was a Harmon event in uh, Las Vegas. And uh, this is a big JBL, uh, big JBL event. So for this, we provided, again, truss, pre-rig truss and motors um and lighting so we prepped this in the shop um it showed up turnkey went in client actually provided the heads on this uh we provided a rental package i think we may have provided one head but uh the event lighting designer was brian hart and he set all this up in advance and uh rolled right in went up bigger package than they were used to. Sorry, I shot backwards there for a second. So again, you know, we had some beam lights on this, LEDs, blinders, effects lights, and, uh, you know, provided a whole system for this. So, you know, front of house package, on stage package, overhead package, all in one. Um, this was the same event, different venue. Um, where we provided a uh, overhead package, onstage package, front of house package. So again, all three separate packages all provided together for the same special event. And sometimes what happens here is you get an adder package with one of the bands too, if there are multiple bands playing, but this was a package for the JBL event. Um, then we get in tour touring concert lighting packages. Now, packages for this are, again, can be broken down in, into uh, separate pieces. So they may get some of the, you know, stage package locally, or they may get the overhead package locally. Uh, this was Godsmack, and uh, 
actually for this, we only provided a small piece. So we were providing uh, one of the fixtures that the main uh, lighting company didn't have available or couldn't get a hold of. Um, so we were just providing that piece of that package. Um, so again, individual pieces may come from different companies. That's just an important concept to understand. And uh, so for this, we are just providing some overhead effect lighting. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of my last photo I like to end with on sort of the conversation of, you know, before we get into actual sort of how the budgeting goes and how proposals look. Um, this is New Year's again, 2014, uh, Miley Cyrus. Um, she, uh, she was the main performer for New Year's. Um, and again, you know, great TV package. You know, we did LEDs, we did front of house, we did follow spots, we did consoles, all those, all those pieces together. And then I'll talk and <clears throat> talk about how some of that stuff's broken up or not broken up, depending on, you know, how you're budgeting your show. So, <clears throat> This is a, a sample proposal that I had together um, for a concert light, lighting package with multiple stages. Um, so you kind of can see here the, uh, the grouping of things. Um, since this is a multi-venue package, um, we were breaking it down into each stage, not into each stage's individual components. So you'll see, this is how they wanted to see the proposal. They wanted to see, <clears throat> they had a very small rig proposal. They had a main stage fixtures. They had a cable package that was cable for everything. Uh, they had a mini stage fixtures package. Uh, they had a street distro package. <clears throat> um, and they had a controlled distro iron expendables package. So they had broken down into those categories already, um, telling me they wanted those prices separate. So this shows you sort of the, the 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 process of, you know, how many fixtures were on, how the breakdown works, um, you know, what you should expect your lighting proposal to look like from your rental company. Um, now we're gonna go to the next slide here. So this is a completely different proposal. This is one for uh, a tour package for uh, a decent sized rig uh, for seven active weeks and nine dark weeks. So this was a, a tour that was out for 16 weeks, but they weren't performing all those weeks. Now, a lot of times the vendors that you work with will give you a different price for dark weeks than they do for rental use weeks, which is what we did here. Um, Crew costs, you know, if, if, you're, if your crew's booked, um, then, you know, you're paying for them. So they work billable weeks and they have the weeks off in between. Um, so, again, those prices are going to vary based on when you book, how far out you book. There's a lot of variables there. Um, you know, and set a 16-week tour could be much less than a, than a five week, uh, sorry, it could be much less than like a 30 week tour, um, but it's probably gonna be more than a five week tour. Um, so, and again, there are notes on here that you know, you'll know you see on your proposals and things you wanna budget for and make sure you have budget for, you know, trucking, uh, perishables, um, you know, maybe you want th three crew people on that. Maybe you want four crew people on that. I've had people request six crew people on their tours. You know, it just depends on, you know, how big your tour is. Now, you know, what level of people you hire for that package is also going to affect your pricing. So if you have a big tour price, you're not going to be able to get, you know, a, a guy who, you know, a less expensive guy who's going to, you know, deal with 10 lights if you're dealing with 200 lights. So again, there's there's scalability, and you know the uh, as your show gets smaller, your crew costs are a higher percentage of your total package cost. 
Um, so here are some other you know things you'll see in a in a proposal, you know, depending on who it's coming from, um, you know, and you know a, a gear list. So this sort of shows you like a breakdown of you know what the expectation is, you know, of the shop to get a list. You know, there, there's very important communication that goes on between the tour and the shop to understand what gear needs to be provided in the bid. So this was a package that had, you know, pretty much everything on it. it had follow spots on it. It had uh, headsets and belt packs, it had dimmers, um, it had uh, media server on there. It had consoles, chain motors, moving lights, LEDs, the whole nine yards. So, this was sort of a sort of a nice way for you to look and sort of see, you know, all these pieces that go together to put the proposal together. So, you know, usually when I tell people who I'm talking to about budgeting, you know, budgeting for their tour, you know, you can budget anywhere from $100 to $400 of moving light per week. Um, and all that pricing is completely dependent on how busy things are, which lights you want to use, um, how new are they, does the shop already own them or not. Um, I see a lot of people are like, well, I just pick from what they have. That's going to save you some money if you pick from the lights that the shop already has. That's a big cost savings for you and the shop as well. So that's a good thing to consider when you're making plans like, you know, is this something where I can go out on a limb and spec a bunch of lights that I know the shop has to go buy? And uh, and if budget's not an issue, then sure, go do that. Um, and I do know designers uh, as well, when they're planning for these packages, they have a designer list. Good things to send in as part of your designer list is make sure that you have spares in there. Um, if you look at this center area um, in my proposal, you'll see that spares are spelled out. So if you have six of the stage bars, you also have an additional spare. If you're using a HOG4 console, you have a spare. There's two Axiom servers. They're not using both of those. One of those is a spare. Make sure you take spare motors. You should have spares of pretty much everything. So if you look on here, you'll see the only thing we don't really car carry spares of is iron or truss. Um, and if it's a big, long tour, they'll also carry some spares for that. Um, but you'll see here that, you know, on the on the Mac Viper line, there are specifically spares spelled out in the package. Um, that's a good thing to spell out in your proposal uh, or your gear list that you're sending to your shop. Be very clear. Um, I like when LDs or producers put in a line that says, please add 20% for spares to be added later or to be determined. Um, now you see on the right here, um, you, you see your, the, the pricing terms and conditions sort of spelled out a little bit clearly here. Uh, you know, this again was a special, uh, a special package. Uh, you know, a lot of these are detailed specifically for whatever you're currently doing. So one tour might have, you know, you know, be performing every single week. One tour might be performing, you know, one week off for two weeks on for another week for five weeks and then off for two weeks. These are important things to understand and they're important things to spell out when you're budgeting a project. So you'll see here. Again, weekly rate to include the following. So we have three crew on this one. You have a crew chief, a motor tech, and a moving light tech. Um, I always like to say, you know, all touring staff to be approved by LD and production team, meaning, you know, we, we send you names of who's available and, you know, you can pick from people you know or people you like. You know, these are important things that you want to be able to be in control of um, when you're doing a lighting package. Um, tentative tour dates. So. This again is a proposal from uh, from 2000, uh, 2013, 2013, sorry, a little trouble speaking this morning. Um, but shop prep, first load in, 
those are the two important dates. Third important date is load return. So like, when's the package coming back? We can't figure out availability or get you pricing if we don't have when you first want to put your hands on the gear, when the gear's leaving the shop, and when the gear returns. These are all very important things for budgeting. Um, because a show that's out for two years is going to be much less than the show that's out for four weeks. This is just the uh, the, the way pricing works. Um, so again, with a tour, you don't know what's going to happen. So the pricing on this is based on a minimum of two weeks of, uh, of full billing. So if you're only going out for two weeks, the pricing is much higher. Um, and again, we're going to expect a deposit um and uh invoicing weekly in that 10 days which means it needs to be paid within 10 days of uh of receiving your your invoice um that's going to be the case in a lot of uh labor situations where you know the the crew has to be paid so the expectation is that the tour is paid weekly um as per the schedule you know whatever touring schedule you have um and then here I've also spelled out a couple things like, you know, zero equipment, you know, that we're not charging for the prep period. Uh, we are charging a percentage for the transportation period. So if you're traveling for a week with the package, there is some cost. Now, again, that's going to vary per show and how long your tour is out and, you know, a lot of factors like that. Um, and then during rehearsals, we're charging half the normal rate and then the normal rate for production periods. Uh, crew rate at 100% for all active periods. So if the guys are there, they're getting paid. Um, and that's prorated by six days a week. Uh, per diem, you know, for crew. So per diem is in addition to their salary. So this is the money that is um you know basically the cost of living to be on the road um now if you look at government per diems you'll see that they're different for every city etc cetera, etc cetera. usually for a tour you're making sure that you give each guy a per diem for the day you're also include in addition to that per diem he's getting room and board so there's food available and uh the the beds taken care of. Um, any costs related to the crew? Again, this is a separate thing usually on the budgeting front. Uh, crew costs per diem, accommodations, travel, immigration fees, transfers, and crowd transportation to be paid by producers. So these are costs incurred by the tour, the show um, that are that are charged separately. Um, and of course, you need to make sure that you have insurance. So there's uh, insurance for the equipment and uh, usually uh, for transportation as well. Um, equipment transportation to be provided for the production. So again, you're not providing insurance on this one because the transportation is being provided by the production. And there you go. So I'm going to open up the Q&A on this. And uh, let me know what the... Uh... All right, perfect. Can you hear me? We have some questions for you. Ah, right. there we go. So... Uh... Okay, the first oh. question is asking... What components are easiest to reduce or eliminate to get closer to an actual budget number? Uh, the easiest things to open, uh, sort of get rid of for budget number are the biggest things. So the most expensive things. The things I usually go see first are follow spot, um, are follow spots. That's usually the first thing to go because they can get those easily locally. And so that's usually the first thing to go out of the touring budget or concert budget. Um, the uh, other things are things that have very large counts. If you have a thousand moving lights and 10 LEDs on the thing, if you're trying to get your budget down, cutting the 10 LEDs isn't going to bring your budget down much when you still have a thousand moving lights. 
All right, next question. What is the most expensive element within any lighting package? Uh, usually I find the most expensive lighting element is uh, the moving light package. So usually that overhead, side light, stage lighting package. Uh, if you want to sort of look into those categories I broke it down into, your overhead package is usually the most expensive package, which is why a lot of smaller tours don't tour with that overhead package because that's the most expensive part. Um, they'll use sort of what's in the venue or what's available locally at a cheaper rate and then use um, the touring floor package. Okay, what are the highest and lowest dollar amounts you have seen for lighting budgets? What's the highest what? Um, the highest and lowest dollar amounts you have seen for lighting budgets. The highest amount I've seen is probably 150K a week. Um, and probably the lowest I've seen is, I mean, I've had some shows just tour with, you know, just tour with their console. And, you know, and, and they didn't want to carry a big console around with them. So they took like a command wing. So that was like $75 a week. All right, if after the first load in, um, some of the gear is cut back and returned to the shop, how do you calculate the reduced cost? Okay, so a lot of times there's two things that can happen at rehearsals. They decide to make the show smaller or they decide to make the show bigger. Um, when they make the show smaller, they usually are looking to save some money. Um, and so the easiest way to sort of continue figuring out what that is, is to re-budget based on what their new package is. So if you had, let's take a show with 100 moving lights, they decide that they only want to go with a package with 50 moving lights after rehearsals. So they return 50 moving lights. So ongoing, you would charge for the rehearsal period for those first 50 lights, but then your package would basically be cut in half, so you'd be paying half the rate. All right, we have a question about um, what are perishables? Would that be something like haze fluid? Yeah, perishables are usually things that are not rented. So things you use up when you're done. So tape, haze fluid, tie line, markers, um, gobo, you know, custom gobos for the event. Um, that's what we considered perishables. Okay, do you have to budget for crew on the dark weeks or do you not normally have to pay for them on the day? Depends on the tour, it depends on the length of time. Um, but usually um, when the people are not working, they're not getting paid. Where in the budget do you generally include atmospherics, fog haze and effects, CO2 jets, confetti, et cetera? Uh, that's usually included in what we call the floor package. So the floor package usually in, uh, includes your atmospherics. So that's where you're gonna have your hazers, your foggers, low fog, all those special effects, fans, because um, those are usually the pieces that uh, they do tour with if they're just touring a floor package. If there is a four to six day gap during tour while traveling between venues that only takes two days to travel, do you still charge a weekly rate for crew? Um, anything that is any week where they're working, they're getting paid. So generally with tour package, this isn't really about, I guess it's a little bit about budgeting, but uh, usually if the guys work, even if it's two travel days and it's a weekly rate, then they're getting paid for the, that week. If it's a daily rate and they, they're getting paid daily, then they get paid their travel day rate and just for those two days. But a tour doesn't normally switch between travel days and, um, I mean, sorry, a daily billing and a weekly bill. So if it's a weekly billing, they're getting paid for the week, you know, that they're, or they're working those, those uh, those days. Now, usually with a weekly rate, though, they're not getting overtime. So 
you know, they may work, be working long days and still be, you know, you know, those two travel days in that week might be, you know, a little bit of a downtime where in the week before they may have worked, you know, more. On average, how much cheaper is a package for a dark week? It varies and it depends on the length of the tour. So again, if you're using a, if you're doing like a year long package, uh, you know, somewhere between zero and 75% is your dark week charge. And again, it depends on the size of the package and how many dark weeks you have. How is equipment insurance handled, included or extra, and who's responsible for arranging it? Um, equipment insurance is arranged and provided by producers. That is, uh, that is the standard. Now, there are cases where um, certain shows have said, you know, we want you guys to provide the insurance for this. We usually refer you directly to a broker who will handle the insurance. We can't technically take out insurance um, without basically causing additional insurance problems ourselves on your tour. Like it's your tour, not our tour. What about cable? Is there a general rule of thumb I can use as a designer to estimate costs for DMX, power, et cetera? I generally say somewhere between 10 and 20% is a good rule of thumb for cable. Um, if you have a heavy, you know, tungsten lighting package that you're touring with, that's going to take a much heavier toll and you're going to need a lot more cable for a package like that than if you're touring with a very light, uh, low power LED system. So again, somewhere between 10 and 20% is sort of a good rule of thumb. Um, I also like to say that, you know, 10 to 20% budget for spares is a good number as well. So both of these are, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the rules of the road, 10 to 20%. What are your pet peeves when it comes to designers submitting equipment lists? Um, I don't know if I call it pet peeves, but the biggest sort of missing piece that we often see is dates. You know, like, well, we don't know exactly what the dates are. Well, for us to put together a price, we need to know what the dates are because rental gear is based on how long it's out, not based on usage. So you're, you're, you're looking at a time formula there. So that's one of the most important pieces. Uh, the second most important piece is make sure you make notes like, you know, we don't know what console we're using yet, but we're definitely going to need a console. And make sure you have all the pieces you need of that puzzle in and you're clear about them in your request for a bid or your request for a quote. Make sure you say things like, hey, I need 40% spares on this for some reason. We're going through some areas that, are, you know, we, we can't get lights out. We won't have time to get lights out. So we need to carry a big spares package. Stuff like that's important to learn about on the front end. Um, so those are the usually the two of the big biggest missing pieces are proper dates and um, notes about consoles, um, spares, and um, quantities. Is there a generic template designers and production managers can use to try and estimate budgets before sending them out for bid? For example, um, 250 a week per Viper, 100 a week per Aura, et cetera. Obviously costs will go down for long tours, but can you offer some sort of generic guidance? I mean, I generally say the budget um, somewhere between two and 300 per week uh, for moving lights. And again, if you have a mix of some expensive moving lights and some cheaper moving lights, you know, you're going to be in a good place. Um, I do tell people, um, you know, 125 bucks a week a motor is a good budget number because um, there's going to be a bunch of other parts and other pieces you need to go with that. Um, those are kind of good budget numbers to go with, you know, and then I usually tell them, you know, 25 bucks an LED fixture, you know, for your LED pars, you know, that type of stuff. 
uh, your LED up lights, stuff like that. That's sort of a good number to put in. If your spares are used up on tour, is it the responsibility of the producer or hire company to pay for the transport for new spares while on tour? Um, that's handled differently in different shops. So it's good to figure that out with your shop in advance about that question. Um, you know, technically uh, you get a, you know, you're getting a warranty on the gear when you're out on tour. Um, so the shop's going to replace broken stuff, but the transportation cost is usually the responsibility of the show. Um, now, again, these things are worked out usually uh, during the bidding process and in those conversations. It's good to have those discussions. Um, some shops will happily ship you um, and, you know, ship you one way as long as you ship them one way. Uh, uh, spare swaps. So again, important thing to have to make sure you have spares and important thing to make sure that you work out whether the show's uh, planning on that expense or they're not planning on that expense. Um, some shows want to see uh, that charged later versus having money in the budget in advance. So, you know, I've had producers ask me both ways. Uh, I don't mind shipping costs later in the show. That's considered a running cost. So make sure that's not in your initial proposal. As a young designer, it can be intimidating to reach out to shops, especially on your first tour, especially if I don't know how much gear I can get for X. Is it okay to reach out for a quote just to get a feeler? Yes, it's okay to ask for, for feeler quotes. Uh, I would just let people know when you're doing that, meaning have that conversation, be like, hey, you know, I get students calling me sometimes and saying, hey, you know, I'm putting together a proposal for, you know, a class project. And if I have the time, I certainly am happy to help them out. Um, but if things are super busy and crazy, I'm going to tell them, sorry, I'm a little too busy at the moment to help you out. You know, here's some other companies to try. Um, that way you don't sort of end up in a situation where you, you know, pissed off a shop and you're going to have trouble getting the quote. It's always good to, you know, have a conversation at the beginning. Um, you know, the, 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 you should have some idea of what you're looking for when you send out your feelers though. You know, if, if you have a tour, you know, and you have a $2,000 a week budget, you shouldn't be sending out, you know, lists with a hundred moving lights on that's probably not your, your, your best bet in getting what you want. You know, the, the end goal is to get something great for what you have. And if you start out with that conversation with many shops at the beginning, they will be happy to sort of tell you how to maximize your dollars. So like, if you call me, we're mostly a Martin shop. So if you call me and you say, Hey, I got X dollars, I want the most amount of lights I can have for the dollar, or I want the brightest lights I can have for the dollar, or I want, you know, the most reliable lights I can have for the dollar. Those are three different things. And I'm going to give you three different products for those conversations. But, you know, somebody's just like, hey, I need, this needs to be 2000 lights and they need to be the cheapest lights you have. You know, that's, you know, what some people are looking for and that's what they're going for. When it comes to negotiations on pricing, how do you approach it? Is it on the fixtures or on the overall package or in other ways? When it comes to negotiations on pricing, I tend to approach it um, on the overall. I try to look at the whole picture, meaning if you have, you know, if you have a stage package that's two grand a week, you have a floor package that's a grand a week, you have a front of house package that's, you know, five grand a week, you know, I look at all those numbers together and try to figure out how to get you the budget based on, on your whole package. So I try to look at a more of a complete number, even though it's broken down into those categories, which allows us sort of to see those pieces. Um, I, I think the overall number uh, when you're working on a tour is more important you ensure the people working with your gear are skilled enough to handle it 
correctly and safely unless it's your own people. Um, how do we insure? Well, we, do, we don't technically insure. So that's the insurance company that does the insurance. <laughs> so we're doing, we're, we're renting you gear. If you don't know how to put it together and make it work, that's not our responsibility. If, if you've chosen to go down that path. Um, I usually get a good feel for it when people are prepping in the shop um, and you know, whether they know what they're doing or not. And, you know, I'll raise a red flag if I think somebody's about to go on tour and be unsafe. How often does a client come to you with a one-off festival asking for a design idea along with a generic budget? And how do you handle that? Um, I'm here to help designers. So it happens to me all the time that people are like, I'm looking for this effect or what new effects do you have? Um, you know, that, that, com that conversation is a great conversation to have with LDs. Um, you know, a lot of LDs will reach out to me and be like, I'm doing this weird thing. What products might fit into it? Um, or do you have any new products that are interesting? So you can also set up demos for them to sort of look at the fixtures and play with some stuff, maybe create some new effects. Um, everybody wants the newest and greatest most of the time. But there are plenty of times that people are looking for something retro, something original, something uh, that nobody's been, uh, nobody's done in a while. So like, even if you look at the package behind me, you know, that's a heavy park hand package, you know, of, of, uh, of source for pars. And they did some amazing looks with it. And, you know, we're able to, to, to pop in and out individual lights um, LED fixtures tend to be cold. They were looking for a very warm look, so they didn't want to go with LEDs. They wanted tungsten. Any tips for building relationships with shop reps like yourself or general etiquette tips? Um, relationships are important, you know, uh, uh, having that conversation and, uh, you know, I, I, I like to, I, I talked about this in a podcast where it's very important for you to realize that you're in an important long-term relationship with your shop and your shop rep. So, you know, I've had, you know, 10, 15 year relationships with a lot of the LDs I work with. Um, and you're in a partnership with them. You know, they're, uh, they're invested in your success. If your show does well, and then you get more shows, you know, it, it, it leads to them it's important to continue the relationship and give and take on both sides. Realize that all relationships are give and take. So if all you're doing is taking all the time, it's not going to be a good relationship for a rep. Um, and they may move on at some point. What is your basic formula for reducing rental rates based upon length of the rental? I don't know that there's an exact basic formula. Um, you know, the longer the tour, the, the less it is per week. You know, if, if you have a tour that's going out for two years, I'm not going to say it's going to be X percentage less than a one year tour, but it is going to be less. Um, you know, anything that's over two years is going to be even less. You know, if you know you have a four year you know, this gear is all going to be out for four years for this album cycle, then you're in a great position. You can get a lot more gear for a lot less money. Um, you know, and the question is, of course, is it working every week? Um, because that also goes into the formula. So there's a lot of little pieces that go into the formula that, uh, you know, everything from availability to length of tour, uh, there's no real specific modifier to that, but I'll, you know, most shops are much, much more open to negotiation on the longer the tour. Is the crew considered to be independent contractors? This also is dependent on the tour. Um, you know, depends how long the tour is, et cetera, et cetera. Some people are, you know, some people are set up to be independent contractors already. That's what they want to be. They want to bill you as an independent contractor. Some people don't. They want W-2s. 
It's a long tour. They're on W-2s then. Just depends on the show. How do you deal with educational institution quotes versus more standard commercial quotes? So there's, there's again, different pricing uh, based, you know, like the reason I showed you all those different types of packages was they're all priced different. So if you're doing a movie package, uh, that might be more expensive than if you're doing a, you know, a high school or a college show. Uh, these tours are, you know, generally uh, just lower budget, you know, projects. Um, so educational stuff is, is usually a lower budget project. Concept is that you're trying to help people, you know, learn about the business or, you know, learn the gear and, you know, start those those long-term relationships while they're young. How do you decide whether to purchase equipment that you don't have but has been requested? Um, so different projects are different. So if you're specking a bunch of gear we have, um, you... Are going to get a lower price than if you're specking a bunch of gear we got to go buy and you know the the, the formula works usually uh in relativity to how much of the package you have to buy so if you have to buy a hundred you know a hundred percent of the lights it's going to be much more expensive than if you only need to buy 10 of the light 10 of the 100 movie lights so again you know the based on percentages now would i not do a tour if it was all lights we had to buy no, I'd certainly do it at the right price. Are bidding wars between you and other vendors common? Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning they are common and they're not, you know, there's plenty of projects where, you know, uh, people know that, you know, I mean, again, look, if a bid comes in and the shop's super busy and they're bidding to a hundred shops, we might, we're not going to take that as seriously as one of our good clients coming to us and saying, hey, do this tour. You know, it's a different conversation. What do you think will happen to pricing schedules for immediate post-pandemic venues versus pre-pandemic average cost rates? One more time. Let's hear that one more time. <laughs> um, they're asking what you think will happen to the pricing schedules for post-pandemic venues versus after or versus um, before the pandemic. Right. So right now I, I, I call most quotes I send out pandemic pricing. So things right now are much cheaper. So again, supply and demand. So there's a lot of gear. There's not a lot of people who need it right now. So you know, supply and demand are, are, are in effect. So there's more gear available, but again, we still might not have all of it. I mean, there's still, you know, there's still some big things going on. So just because we're in the middle of a pandemic doesn't mean I'll necessarily have everything you want, but things will be cheaper. I think, uh, well, things I know are cheaper right now and things will still probably be cheaper next year. Uh, probably for the at least for the first year. Although I imagine when things actually then return and we all get super busy, the opposite's going to happen. There won't be enough gear for everybody because a bunch of shops will be gone and a bunch of shops won't be able to buy any more gear. And a lot of people will have sold off a lot of gear that they could sell off. So again, supply and demand there won't be very much gear and there'll be a lot of people who want to use it. If a tour is out for a long time, one plus years, should you expect the higher company to take the gear back and check it over at any point, like during a dark week, or is it the responsibility of the producer to long-term maintain the gear? Um, so when you rent equipment on a tour package, uh, the expectation is that you uh, maintain the gear during your rental period. So whether that's the guys who are on the tour are maintaining it, but the package is supposed to be maintained by the tour. Um, if they don't maintain it, then of course it'll break down more often and you'll be spending money that way. Um, but certainly if, 
you have broken gear, you can swap it out. But if you just want everything cleaned out, new lamped, stuff like that, that's the touring crew's job. Do you rent to venues that don't have budget to purchase their in-house systems? If so, how is that priced differently? Um, so there's two types of rentals that go to venues that don't have in-house systems. One is a long-term rental, which is a uh, gear that they just keep in house and rent year to year. Um, I have a, a few packages out like that where, you know, they're paying a very low rate. Um, they're required to maintain and fix the gear. Um, although they, they swap it out if it's broken, broken. Um, but they're, they're the ones who are maintaining it. Um, that is a, a low price, or if you want to look at a slightly higher price, you're then looking at spending more money for one-offs here and there. So, you know, they're like, well, we need, you know, a hundred moving lights for this show, 20 moving lights for that show, five moving lights for that show, six moving lights for that show. Then that pricing is going to be based more on one-off pricing, which is significantly higher than a long-term package. Um, I had a discussion with somebody not so long ago where we were talking about would it, they have a long-term package in, they're like, well, can we just pay every time we use it because of the COVID situation? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And then they looked at that price and it was higher than their monthly. And they're like, well, we're using it more than once a month. So we're definitely going to continue the long-term package. What about sub rentals? about some <laughs> they, happen, <laughs> they happen all the time i mean shops run out of gear they need more gear you know we we, we kind of we we move uh you know we we move gear around maybe during prep we found out three of the lights were broken uh we're not going to send them to you so we sub run three lights from another vendor um you know that's not going to affect your package um if you spec a package that i have to sub rent the whole package then I'm going to get that pricing before I give you a price. And, you know, uh, that way it works its way into the package on the front end. When sending a package out for bid, what is the best way to negotiate bids between multiple shops so that I get the best deal? How do you like to be told if you got the bid or you didn't email or by phone? Um, I think email or phone are both both ways to, to be told, <laughs> you know, either either way, I just like to be told I didn't get the bid to stop working on it. Um, what's the best way to negotiate between multiple shops so you get the best deal? Um, I, I don't think necessarily bidding shows out to multiple shops is always the best way to get a deal. Um, I think if you really need a specific deal uh, you have a relationship with somebody, you call them up and you have that conversation. Uh, th those are the best deals I've ever given um, have been on people like, hey, Chris, I need a favor on this one. Or, you know, this could turn into additional work, et cetera, et cetera, where you're investing in the LD's future. Um, or they're willing to invest some future business in you. Um now, if you put a show out, you may get a crazy cheap low bid. Um, but remember the formula, you know, cheap, fast, right, pick two, right? So you, you get to pick two out of three. <laughs> so it's either going to be fast, cheap, or right. <laughs> Will your payment terms need to be different post-pandemic since you won't know the financial health of any company when we return to normal? It's already changed. Uh, you know, pricing is uh, uh, pay up front right now much more than it, than it has been in quite a while. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, I got sent, like I've been doing this since I was little. So I would be sent to the box office to pick up uh, the payment for the rental package uh, as the box office was closing out. I think we're much, uh, we're much more back to that world where, you know, producers are going to, you know, are going to have to pay at the venue or, you know, pay in advance and pay, at the, you know, pay the balance when on arrival. Um, because <clears throat> lighting shop only has power um, until the show's over. 
you know, and then we're on, you know, we're, we're at the mercy of, of hope. All right, it looks like that was the last question to come in. Um, so thank you so much, Chris. This was a great presentation, uh, a nice end to our 2020 um, learning sessions. We're in the final week before we roll into 2021. So we just have a couple more. So thank you for presenting. I hope everybody has a happy holiday and uh, gets all the lights they dream of for their next touring package. <laughs> Thank you everyone for attending. Um, as I mentioned, there's a couple more sessions this week and then we'll be posting sessions for 2021. So check that out on our calendar at pro.harman.com. Thank you. And if I don't see you online in the next couple of days, have a wonderful holiday season. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody.